Austin has the gift <laughs> of sharing with you the way you need to participate, sharing with the plants you have in your world that you're creating. And without that participation on both sides, you're always going to be wondering, why doesn't this look good to me? And the reason is because you haven't come to know the plants. It's not a complicated situation. It's very simple. So thanks, Austin, for being here and sharing that with everyone. Thanks for coming out, too. Thank you, Roy. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. It's always fun to be out here at um, North Wind. Uh, it's definitely it's one of my favorite happy places. I come whenever I just need to get away. And um, yeah, there's just so many beautiful things here, whether it be the gardens, the plants, the people that work here. So it's really fun to uh, always see there's always something new because as gardeners, no matter what age we are, we're always learning because there's always coming up with new things. The climate's changing. Um, yeah, there's always new combinations and none of us know everything. So we, it's great when we can get together to talk about plants and what's working for us and what's working for other people. So um, uh, uh, I met Roy uh, about 14 years ago. I was uh, at a lecture and uh, it was really, I was so inspired listening to his talk and seeing the pictures that he had on the screen. And it was, I was so moved by it. And I said, I've never seen anything like this before. Like, this is what I need to do in the future. I wanna make people feel the way that I feel when I see his pictures and hear him talking emotionally about plants and how they go together. Cause all I've heard is just like, oh yeah, put the mulch down. Then we gotta replace them in five years. And you know, just all, so it's never just been a romantic thought. So I definitely wanted to learn more about that. And my supportive family had like, let us come up on trips or we'd come to Lake Geneva seven hours from Western Iowa and from Carroll, Iowa. And we would drive seven hours to come to Northwind. So if you live close, you're very lucky and fortunate to have this Mecca here. And I wish I had it closer, but we would have to stack, uh, stack our, we'd be, have four people in a Highlander. And I think we fit 800 plants in one time to go back to Iowa. And I was like, oh yeah, I got this. And I think I had maybe a hundred and Roy's like, step aside, I got this. <laughs> and so it was just like, yeah. So now I'm like the king, at, <laughs> I don't need a pickup truck. I've got my, Highlander and I can fit a bunch of plants in there. But um, yeah, so I'm yeah, very fortunate. I feel blessed to have like a garden here at Northwind and uh, kind of to come full circle here and spend so many visits and getting to know Roy. And uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, it's been in here two years and um, uh, shade gardens I think are under uh, yeah, underestimated, undervalued. A lot of people are just like, oh, it's shade, sun has all the color, and that's kind of what I thought too. And then I um, got a job at Millennium Park, uh, uh, a design, uh, they're one of my clients, and so I have done 30,000 square feet of shade gardens there. So I've learned a lot about shade over the last five years. And, um, and so I'm excited to be able to show you here. And it's a lot about texture and different tones of green and, um, and then using the right plants because we have a lot of dry shade because of trees. And you can see a lot of people think there's excuses and say like, I have a walnut tree, I have the tree roots, and then this is a whole forest of walnut trees. And you can see every plant that he sells grows underneath of them. So it's just a wise tale that gets passed along from generation to generation. Um, so um, yeah, so I think like one of the biggest things I like to do when I start a shade garden is to start a really good ground cover. And so one of the best things to do that with is the Carex. Um, you know, Roy was talking about Carex probably 20 years ago and everybody thought he was crazy and they still do. But, <laughs> um, but they're just, they're such an amazing grass and so important. And, um, you know, a lot of people find it hard to pay for a foot by foot grass and they want to take up as much space as possible. But you can see how that, just melds through the planting here. And I like, you know, now that they're two years old, they're just so gorgeous and they have this texture and the resiliency, they don't brown out. Um, this is called Wood Sedge Carex albicans, um, but this is a native Carex and uh, great for dry shade. So right next to the trunk of your tree, instead of having that mulch ring, put Carex albicans. Um, there's also, so I'm gonna trip over these plants. Uh, you know, Carex Pennsylvanica is a very uh, popular Carex as well that um, is used most by like people in the industry. And the only problem with this one is it does brown out in the middle of summer with our humid summers. So it's a great plant and a workhorse and it'll fill in. 
um, but it, it doesn't stay green all season long like Carex albicans does. And then this one has a rhizominous habit, so um, it spreads like gently into other plants and melds into other plants. So depending on what your use is, um, I, I love the clumping version. It just like looks like all these little wigs placed on the ground. Um, and then uh, the this new Carex that um, Roy has is a Carex humilis, and it looks amazing. It's by the front sign when you come in, and I look at it every time I come here, and every time I see him, he's like, you gotta see the Carex humilis, it's looking so good. But this one does well in dry shade to sun as well, and it's a clumper, and it's just so beautiful, and I saw it this winter, it looked good. And so if you can, and Carex albicans stay semi-evergreen in the winter as well, so there's just such a good use of these plants, and, and he sells them in the plug size, so it's nice and more economical to be able to put more of these in and I space them about a foot away from each other when I use them. And the great thing when I say like start with a ground cover, that's because that helps suppress the weeds. And so when you're starting to add like a very dynamic shade garden, the biggest thing is just to capture those weeds, the tree seedlings and all of that stuff. So if you can get that ground cover, whether it be a Carex or the uh, barren wart epimedium towards the front there, um, is another great ground cover. Uh, wild ginger, uh, the asarum is really good. So I would just like do big swaths of those three things. And then after that gets established, then you can start adding in some of the magical like seasonal plants that flower throughout different times of the year. Um, the uh, uh, Overall, I'm really happy with what the garden looks like and how it's um, filling in. I would say I would maybe add larger groups of the hookara. This uh, red hookara is hookara watermelon carnival, and um, right here. And the uh, the key with hookaras is getting the velosa variety. So when you see it, it'll say like hookara, and I don't even know what the other ones are because I don't use them. But the velosa is the really strong genetics that keep the, that stay alive. And so Roy had planted this somewhere, and he said it had been living for 10 to 12 years. And I was like, oh, amazing. So, uh, and then this is also a hookara um, velosa called Autumn Bride. And a lot of people don't give this one a lot of credit because it's green and you don't see a lot of green ones. But this is one of my favorite ones because it's so resilient and the leaves get about five to six inches wide. And then it's a fall bloomer and it'll have these beautiful white bell shaped flowers. So in a woodland garden with that dappled light coming through and you do a cluster of like 10 to 15 of these in a group and they all just meld together and have this beautiful large foliage next to Carex. That's so magical to me. And then what's great is the Hooker Watermelon Carnival blooms in the spring. It'll be blooming in about two weeks here. And so you can use both of them and then you have a spring bloomer and a fall bloomer. So it's just, and you can change it up. And, um, and then also I've been kind of trying with designs, doing different things. This is ladies mantle. And so the ladies mantle, you can see the uh, the water droplets on here. I had my aunt carry it over here and I'm like, don't let the droplets fall off. <laughs> but the, um, but yeah, I just love the way that glistens. And so when you're doing a garden, like um, I like to do a lot of repetition. And so you can see like I have the groups of hookara in kind of a triangle formation. And so when you're, when something's blooming or looking really good at a certain time, it's nice for your eye to like start here and then move your way through the garden with whatever that theme plant is that's blooming at that time of the year. So having that repetition is really important. So if you just start with a, this and then people are like looking for more and so it kind of draws you through the garden. So I really like to make sure I repeat things and, uh, and at least start with groups of three or five, you know, cause it can, your garden can look a little bit chaotic if it's just onesies of everything. So it's nice to add some groups. And, um, and then, like I said, if you didn't want to do like a spring bloomer with the watermelon carnival and a fall bloomer with this one, I like using both of these in a design and every other group. I, I use the, uh, the ladies mantle and every other group I use the Hookrow um, Autumn Bride and then the ladies mantle blooms in the spring and this blooms in the fall and it's got the same shaped leaf. So it's really cool just to kind of um, extend the bloom season with that. And so I would definitely like, yeah, I could definitely add some more of this, like instead of maybe the Autumn Bride, could add um, some of the ladies mantle. Too many plants, I got a little excited this morning. <laughs> it always happens when I'm here. My mom, I'm like, oh, don't worry, we won't send that much home with you today, but I haven't made my list yet. Um, yeah, and so the, um, um, you know, and then last year we added some of the, 
uh, Aqualegia, I can't think of the common name, but the um, Columbine. Columbine. Yeah, so the Columbine I just added because it's just a nice spring color to add. And then this is Japanese forest grass. And so it gets a beautiful, like two foot tall and it just has tons of movement and beautiful. And so I've got just three swaths of that in here. And then right now, uh, what's great about the columbine is in a young garden, it kind of fills in all of the holes and so it'll seed around. So if there is a hole, it'll just like drop in and it's not like an invasive plant that's gonna push out other partners or other uh, plants. So that's what I really love about um, Aqualegia. So we've got the yellow one in here and then I just brought in the native one, Canadensis. And yeah, you can't be scared. And maybe just you can, if you wanna add three in your whole garden, you know, they'll seed around and then next year you'll have, you know, 20, 50. Um, but in a good way, in a good way. Um, and then since I'm talking about the, yeah, uh, the hookara, uh, at Millennium Park, I did this combination that people loved this spring. Um, it's the um, umbrella threaded, shredded plant. Like this is, you can't find this anywhere. Nowhere else would sell this plant except for Northwind. So uh, if you like it, I would definitely get it. But the, uh, it's just such a beautiful texture and like having this just sit and, and like above all of the grasses or anything, um, it's called Sinalesis echinitifolia. And um, it's sending up the flower shoot right now and it's not very exciting. It's just a tiny little poof of uh, white. Uh, but this foliage is just so cool. And when it emerges, the, f uh, the petals go downwards and it looks like an alien and it's like a hairy silver, uh, foliage so it's just those special moments and it's not just about oh this is what it does and so it's like every year they just get this nice clump and they stay in their clump and they'll slowly spread um, and make a nice um, clump for you like I said but I love having it come through this combination and this is just all texture and no blooms and it's absolutely gorgeous so what I would do is add, you know, make a bigger group and maybe add like seven to nine um, hookara and then maybe pop in two or three of these within that group and then they just float above and it's just this like awesome dynamic. Uh, this gets about, about 18 inches to two feet tall. Yeah, so about like this. And so they're just, like I said, and then I, I dot them around. I don't use them in like big swaths or anything. I just like, like dot one here, one there, one there, like three here, five there, three there. Um, and so I just like, so I'm gonna add some of these into that group just to add a little bit more dynamics. And uh, shredded umbrella plant, uh, Sinalesis. Yeah, so that's what's special about the garden. It's never static. And so a lot of my designs, they'll, they'll have me come back the first three years to make sure everything's working the way I thought it was going to work. And it's like, okay, do we need to add a different Carex? Are we using, you know, are you irrigating too much? Are we, you know, you know, filling the ground as fast as we can to help suppress the weeds? And if not, then I might, you know, change a plant and try to fix those and have solutions. And um, uh, what else we got here? And I just, I love the groups of, um, he, he didn't have any of these last year, but the Aruncus uh, is goat's beard. So a lot of people know goat's beard is like a six foot tall shrub, like the native one, but these are like native ours and they are uh, about 18 inches to two feet tall and they just create this nice mound and they have that beautiful bronzing foliage and it's a great substitute for a still bee because the still bees, they just don't grow in our soils. It's nice, it's dry or for a drier garden. If you have a wet garden, like keep using a still bees, I'm just jealous. Um, but this is called Misty Lace. So uh, goat's beard, Misty Lace. And um, yeah, I like to use them in small groups and just like six, and then you could pop one here and one here just to make it look a little more natural. And I, and then this looks so beautiful after it's done blooming too. It keeps the seed head form. And yeah, and it, it's just, I, I absolutely love it. So it's kind of my substitute for a still bees. What's right in front of you with the white? Yeah, so that's um, uh, polygonatum. So like when I have all of these groups, uh, it's nice to have a little bit of something that adds a little spontaneity. So this is uh, Solomon Seal. Um, it's Polygonatum Multiflorum. And, um, and then you can see, so then that's Multiflorum and this is Biflorum. So this is our native one. And this one can get like two to four feet tall. There's, there's variation, which is really cool, I think. Um, and this one's just a little more rigid and tighter feel than that one is. 
And this one just hasn't fully done its thing yet, but it'll have that same large leaf. And, but yeah, I love these. And then the white flowers turn to purple berries when it's done blooming. So that's just, again, and they hold on all summer long. So uh, beautiful architectural plant. So it's like, I have all this nice ground cover. Now I need something with form and structure. And then you can see I did like three here and then one there. And so when I work with Roy and Pete Aldoff, this is like, oh, this is how we can make it look a feel a little bit more natural, even though there's nothing natural or you know about this garden you're not gonna be able to find this in nature but i'm going to try to make it feel that way and be able to take care of it because that's the biggest thing with these gardens is the maintenance and knowing like is that a plant is that a plant so if it gets too jumbled and too much going on it's hard to know what's what and so i try to make it like easy to be like okay there's five of these so that must be a good thing and we'll keep that but um uh we gotta do what we can do <laughs> uh another one of my favorite in the, um, uh, Galenia, this is Portoranthus. I think it's just the biggest workhorse plant that I'm aware of. It grows well in shade to sun, wet to dry. Uh, it's um, Bowman's root. Um, so there's these beautiful red stems. It comes up bronze and then it has kind of like a gara like flower. So a white uh, poof of flower in the middle of June. And then it gets the cute little like, I don't want to call them rose hips, but the uh, uh, the buds are really pretty after it's done blooming as well. And then it has like a fire engine red fall color. So a lot of people don't think about fall color when it comes to perennials. So I just absolutely love this one. And uh, my parents have a Norway maple at home and like around, that's like one of the driest, like water sucking trees. And we, around the base of the tree, we have this planted and it's thriving. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think if you, the more light it gets, I have it at Millennium Park and like dappled sun and it still turns red, but it, yeah, it's definitely more dramatic the more sun it gets, but it still is going to turn orangey probably for you in the shade. Yeah, so this is uh, Bowman's root. And then there's two different ones that he has in there. There's, uh, I don't know the difference in common names, but the, um, the uh, trifoliatus is the non-native, which is this one. And then there's stipulatus, which is the native one. And it has more of a shredded foliage instead of uh, full uh, leaves. And I don't know, I, I prefer this one, but the other one's nice too. Um, yeah, so the, um, and then I added Christmas fern. So Christmas fern is a native fern for us and does well in dry shade. So that doesn't happen with a lot of ferns. They always need moisture. So I love the Christmas fern. And so I've kind of added them in small little pockets here. And so I'm gonna definitely thicken those groups up because they just take three to four years to really grab hold. And then once they do, they thrive. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna make some smaller groups, but then I added some Dryopteris marginalis. Um, and I absolutely love this fern and it's kind of a clumper as well. So it's a fun one to just dot around and you can do them in groups as well. But that can also tolerate a little bit more dry conditions than other ferns. And I just love, I mean, ferns are beautiful, but we know ostrich fern and some of the other ones take over. And so these are two well-behaved ferns that I like to use in shade gardens. Ooh. Um, and then some of those, we always have problem spots along the edges of gardens and where the weeds just always grow and we can't seem to fill them. But I absolutely love um, Iris cristata. This is a native iris. Um, it's crested, crested iris, I think it's called, um, with these cute little spring flowers and it'll just be covered in them. Uh, probably, yeah, blooms right now. And this just cute little foliage. And so um, one of the changes I made were along the edge I added I filled in, in between the Carex and the groups, the, um, the iris. And they look so good, this texture with Carexes. And so that soft texture of a Carex grass and then the iris foliage looks so good. And then this is also a woodland edge, dry shade uh, plant. And, and I also wanted to talk about Carex woodii. So again, it doesn't look super exciting in this pot, but Carrick's Woody Eye is, uh, Mount Cuba is a research center in Delaware, and they came up with their, uh, they do trials on like the uh, breadth of like a, of a genus. And so they did like trials of a hundred different Carrick's, and this was the like number one performer. Uh, so it's Woods, Woods Sedge. And, um, and so, like I said earlier, Carex Pennsylvanica 
is a runner, uh, a slow, run a gentle runner, and so is this, but this one is thicker, so you don't get the weeds that are inside of the crown of the plant. And so that's the biggest thing with runners is that, and I've heard from some of the people that take care of our gardens, they're like, oh, I'd like the ones that spread by rhizomes, they're not, they're, they're a little bit too open, and then I have to go in with a tweezers and get out weeds. So these are the things we need to think about. It's like, okay, well, let's try to solve that problem. And Woody Eye solves that problem, and it's a thicker, denser, um, habit and so it's going to do the similar thing to Pennsylvanica and it's sold out everywhere and I can't seem to find it so um, it's a great one to use and like I said it's a uh, fun to mix them together I didn't do a lot of that uh, here I used mostly um, the oak sedge the pencil uh, the albicans but I, I'm definitely gonna add groups of like three or five of these throughout because it is a little bit taller than the oak sedge. So these are about 12 inches tall and then this will be like 14 to 20 inches tall. So just a little bit different uh, tone of green and height. Um, what's up? Yeah, yeah, dry, yeah, dry to well-drained. Woods, woods, uh, wood sedge, yep. And you know, this garden is a small space, so it's about 20 by 20 maybe. And so like, I want, I want to add everything. That's the hardest thing as a designer. You start making your list and you're like, okay, let's calm down. We need to pare it down a little bit. And so I think like, you know, I would love to add uh, geranium is amazing. And this is called uh, um, geranium Bevins variety, macrorhizum. And it's got this beautiful fragrance to the leaves and it's just a workhorse again. Like if you have a crown, of a you know tree instead of putting mulch down this is such a good one and it runs by rhizomes and so it like gently as well again so if it if it butts up to another plant it'll stop and it's not going to necessarily run it over unless it's something super delicate like a trillium or something but otherwise um, it's one of my favorites and blooms in late may june and looks good um, through the winter so that's a great geranium and like to use those in groups because things that run a little bit, you want to use those in groups and not as individuals because if you dot them around, then it's going to, you know, they want to run. So they want to be with themselves. So that's, those are the kinds of things that you learn. Like when you see uh, in a pot, like you can see this aster, like it definitely wants to be with itself because it's filling in this pot and it probably has only been in here not very long. And so I'll talk about that since I am uh, have it here, um, aster twilight is one of my favorite asters. Um, I have a project in the middle of a forest and they, they, they didn't, uh, the deer did not touch these. And so asters are usually a deer lover, but um, the, uh, I had other asters in groups of three around and they went around the whole garden. There's about five groups and they ate just those groups of aster and they didn't touch this. So, um, so there's something to that, but I love this aster. It does well in dappled shade to full sun and uh, normal soil and it blooms in August and then it gets these beautiful seed heads that um, shine in the sun in the middle of winter. The, the sun reflects off of the seed heads and it's so beautiful and it's, I use it in every project. It's one of my favorite asters. Uh, it's about 24 inches yeah, to 30 inches tall. Yeah, so it's very, like I said, it just keeps in its own. So they're in groups, they're over there and you can see how they kind of, there's a grouping over here as well. And you can see how they're growing rhizominously and there's no space for weeds to get in it. And that's what I love about it. It's just a total workhorse and uh, we'll cover the ground and nothing can really compete inside of the crown of the plant. Um, another geranium I like to use for dry shade is this uh, al uh, Sanguinium album. So geranium album. Uh, it's a white flower and it's, it does well in dry shade, gets red fall color. So again, like multi-seasonality. And so just having little groups of this and like groups of five in the carex and that texture and that nice glossy foliage and just, um, and blooms in June. So that's another nice spring blooming geranium. Uh, and then I always talk about hostas. Hostas are overused um, and they're great and you know, they're deer food and um, they're, I like to use them, but they're, you know, they, they don't look like anything in the winter. So you have no winter interest with them because they collapse and turn into mush. And so you can see here, like this is summon substance. It's one of my favorite ones because you can just add a sprinkle of them in. So I have two here, one there, and then they'll get really nice and big in a few years and they'll get about 
30 inches tall and two to three feet wide. And they're just, I just love just having them dotted through to have that big architectural foliage again. So we have this for the architectural uh, with the polygonatums and then the hostas as well. And, and then if I do use a smaller hosta, I like to use halcyon and do small groups of like seven together, just so that there's not gonna be so much focus. If your garden's 75% hostas, then you have nothing to look forward to for six months out of the year. Um, yeah. Uh, another fern I hadn't talked about is this native fern. Uh, maidenhair fern. I absolutely love this one as well. I just, it, it doesn't seem like it should be a native. I'd always think it like looks tropical. It's got the black wiry stems and, and when they're emerging, they're just so, I don't know, alien-like. It's so cool. I'm mad every year when I forget to, when I don't get to see it, um, but they're just so cool. And then they just sway in the wind and that, they have that kind of chartreuse foliage. So it looks good against everything else. So again, like if I wanted to, I could add <laughs> everything in here, but I, I'm really happy with how things are filling in. And I think just a few more ferns and filling in some of the groups um, is helpful. And um, like over here, I had a, I think it's a Carex flaccosperma. I'm seeing that it comes in a little bit later. And so I'm needing something around that to help uh, suppress the weeds in the spring. So I added a few, so I'm gonna mix it with the Carex um, albicans or the Carex uh, woody eye that I'm going to add into here um, so I can suppress those weeds early spring and um, I didn't realize that it didn't come up um, so early and and it seems to be more of an upright one too and so it needs something or they need to be planted closer together or a companion plant around it so that's that the I also want to talk about meadow rue um, is a underutilized native plant. Uh, it's right here. So I just added small groups and with the slightest breeze, it just, the way it moves is just so elegant and beautiful. And they've got silver under leaves and green on the top. And then they're they, one of the first perennials to bloom in the spring. Uh, they come up I don't know, probably early April and they're this tall. It's amazing uh, what they do, but you don't need a lot of them, like three in a group or just one, you know, dot one around. And like, this is, you know, one plant here. Um, so about 18 inches wide, two and a half feet tall. So I really love that one. And you can see they got some purple stems and they're just, yeah, really beautiful. And if you, yeah. What was the name of that one again? Uh, Meadow Rue, Thalictrum dioecum, or Thalictrum dioecum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then this is a kind of a woodland edge plant. This is, um, uh, Jerusalem sage and this is really pretty too if it gets enough sunlight it likes moisture so if you have a moist garden um, I always talk about dry shade because I seem to never get <laughs> a wet shade garden uh, but this one is beautiful because it blooms it gets this tall so like early in the spring it'll, it'll get maybe three feet three and a half feet tall and it gets these beautiful purple flowers uh, these purple like um, rows of flowers around the outside of the stem. And then it looks amazing when it's um, out of bloom as well and having these architectural uh, punctuations throughout the garden. So again, just using groups of three and then one there, one there, another group of five. Um, they're just so beautiful and a purple and great foliage. But if you do have it in some dry area, it'll just kind of brown out and you'll just have to kind of chop back the foliage and it'll come back next year. So. Great plant. Um, and then one other grass I wanted to talk about is this uh, tufted hair grass. I love using this one. Uh, it needs like probably four hours of sun a day, but it's a semi evergreen tufted hair grass and uh, gold tau it's called. And it stays, the, the main foliage stays about this tall. And then it gets these beautiful foot panicles and it's just like iridescent, it's um, frothy seed heads. And then the way the sun hits it, it just glows. So by putting groups of like three to six, like I'll just, I always make little, um, just little circles in a garden. Uh, like I'll put like three groups of them, but I would love to add these into groups of the Carex. So then you'll have that kind of glow uh, throughout and kind of uh, really make the Carex look alive and I think they'll really look nice together. And it's a semi evergreen grass too, so it keeps that green through most of the winter. So I really love it. Um, I think that is the majority of the plants I wanted to talk about, but there's a few tools I wanted to talk about. 
that I love to use just to make life a little easier. I always think everybody uses this stuff because that's what I've used because I learned from a younger age what to use. And um, I love this hand weeder because, you know, once your garden fills in, there might be something next to the crown of your plant and you can really get in there and get it out. And so it's just a really easy tool. Um, so I love this weeder and then the for a newer garden um, that has space, the Dutch hoe is really amazing. I know Roy's been promoting it for years, but it's got the diamond blade on it. I give one to every one of my clients because it's just so ergonomic and it just glides on top of the soil. And so in between when it's filling out in the spring, you can just go right in between and get all of the weeds out and you don't, you're not bake, you know, hurting your back. I have uh, people that just love coming home from work and picking this up and getting out in the garden and you know, and it's like, you don't have to do it all at once. It's like, okay, you know, three, day, three times a week, you go out there and do this part of the garden. And then the next day you go out with your wine. The next day you can take this out again. But I really love this tool and it's just invaluable. And I think everybody should have one. Um, and it's just so, yeah, I mean, it's gonna last forever. And it's got diamond, so it's sharp on both sides so that it's gonna cut the weeds um, on both sides, uh, at the, your forward position and your back. So instead of sitting there with a hoe trying to, get it out and having your back hurt. Yeah, and these are all inside the barn for sale, but I just, and then the, uh, this it's called the spearhead spade, but I just love, I remember when I found one of these, the way, like it just goes into the soil so much nicer because of the cut of the blade. And so it just makes it so much easier to plant perennials. And so I absolutely love this um, shovel as well. And yeah, I don't use anything else. When people have something else, I'm like, oh, let me go to my car and grab my, my shovel that I got to use. But uh, is there any questions right now? But thank, I just want to thank you all for coming. It's always so nice to see people show up and, um, <laughs> and talk plants. So, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, just a little comment on that small weeder. Yeah. I put some bright orange duct tape around the handle because I leave it late. Oh, yeah. Time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I've lost many of tools until the until the employer says like, oh, you're gonna have to pay fifty dollars for each tool you lose. Then I'm like, oh yeah, let's get the duct tape out. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely a problem to lose tools. Yeah. Mm -mm. No. Yeah. No. So yeah, the, a lot of these other ones, if you yeah, if you use them in the right space, um, you know they they thrive and look so good. But yeah, the woody eye stays green. It's a little bit darker green than the albicans. And it's, yeah, it's just so beautiful. And just, yeah, doing pockets of it is great. Um, and like we said, certain ones, like uh, I was talking to Roy about radiata is a really fine texture one, but it's, it's a nice one. But then the problem is, is it does flop after it's done flowering. So unless you have it next to a partner that's gonna hold it up, it's fine. But um, if it is just on its own, you're gonna kind of get a flat look. So it's just, you just have to know that. And if you're fine with that, that's, that's okay. But um, yeah, there's just so many different ones for different things. But like I said, my favorite are Montana for dry sun uh, to shade. And then the Albicans and the uh, Humalis is so good. I'm just like so excited. He's like, oh, I got 1,500 of them. I'm like, not anymore. And so he's got to watch out what he says to me because I'll use them all. But yeah, Carrix are just so underutilized and be one of the cool kids and put them in. Yeah. Yeah, probably like the woody eye if it has like that running, you know, habit and you know, they're so like all of these clumpers are going to just do their Full thing. Sun. Full sun. Yeah. Um, um, bromoides, um, I've seen, yeah, bromoides, is it, you said dry or like medium heavy soil? One's wet and one's really dry. Yeah, so bromoides is amazing one I didn't mention, but that is a great, um, it's a little bit lighter green than this one even and it does well in wetter conditions to drier conditions, but it doesn't want to suit, like completely dry out, but it's such a good one, Bromoides. Yeah. Is it like it's a clumper. Like a yeah, a lot of them are like 14 inch spread. Yeah. So what do you do with, um, or how do you get rid of tree sap and things like that? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just with tree seedlings, you have to get them early, you know, right when they're starting in the spring with the Dutch hoe, just getting out there. Cause any, if they set on any roots, then 
it's game over and you have to pull them or it becomes, or get the, the tiny hoe out and really get them out. So it's just, yeah, if you can just pay attention, get them out early, young, that's, yeah, yeah unfortunately. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I just try to out-compete them with something else. That's like, yeah, you just gotta find something that comes in super early in the spring and is just gonna like fill, fill in and yeah, suppress them, yeah. Um, so we have like a shady but north-facing slope. So when you mentioned that one came in late, that really hit yeah. home. Anything else that you stay away from that doesn't might be out-competed because our oh. temperatures stay so low for so long. Oh, yeah. That anything that's behind is probably going to not make it. Yeah. No, I think all this, yeah, it comes up pretty quick and about the same time. And as long as it has its space, you know, if you make it a group and it comes in a little bit later, it's fine. It's just the weeding is going to be the issue. But, um, but yeah, I just, I would say, because you can see like the Japanese forest grass comes in a little bit later. Um, but, you know, if you have them close together, they, they do like, will kind of suppress other things out as they get as they mature but you can see the carex does it immediately and uh but yeah yeah i would say the only thing seems to be that carex flock of sperm is a little bit later but it just needs a companion plant otherwise it's not a problem planting them and then second question mm -hmm. as you fill in your garden because i mean you know, things are going to develop over time are you worried about any root disturbance for anything like would you not want like if that fern doesn't like root disturbance like how do you, how do you deal with plants that maybe are a little bit more tender Like roots from trees or? No, no, like you're gonna plant that plant right next to that. Oh tree. yeah. Is planting that plant to fill in the garden gonna harm any of its friends around it? No, yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't put it there if it did. And like um, that one's probably a little bit close. I, I think it got moved or I might have hit it or something. But uh, I think I was gonna maybe replace it with that grass, but. Um, but yeah, I think, no, it's fine. And the whole key is planting things about a foot to 15 inches apart to make sure it grows in as fast as possible to lower the maintenance. And most plants can handle that. But over time, if there's one that's that you want to move and move somewhere else and the other plants can fill in that space, then great. But, um, but no, there isn't any harm. These plants all are just tough and strong and can hold their own. Oh, yeah, so we cut, yeah, so the gardens are great because uh, we, like, I think Roy started the mowing um, revolution of uh, cutting the, or just, just, you know, just cutting back the gardens and leaving the debris there is so important. And like, it's something that I never would have thought about. And we're just so used to hauling it away, you know, trimming it and by hand. But I mow all of my gardens down with like a mulching blade. Uh, four inches high and so that you're not hitting any of the crowns of the plants and then you just go through and you mow on top of it two or three times and make the debris small and then that's the mulch for the next year because this is the worst year I've ever seen for mulch. I've seen so much over mulching it's disgusting and I'm just so tired of seeing plants just being like just you know there's like a whole like volcano around every perennial and that's why our plants are dying so everybody's saying oh i can't keep a plant alive i don't have a green thumb but our industry keeps saying put four inches of mulch every year on which is just like i mean four inches of mulch and you have your perennial down here i don't know how they stay alive and so when you're doing that every year it doesn't de you know degrade and it doesn't um disintegrate in the soil like people think it does and so i just went to a golf course that i was doing a project on and there there's only woody plant material that was left living and all the perennials had died and she's like well i don't want to replace it we don't want to do this again in five years and i said well this is the reason i said everybody calls from the club in may and says it's got to look pristine we've got to have that beautiful fresh mulch put on before the members start coming and then um and then they put that two inches of mulch on every year and so i dug my heel and it went eight to 10 inches deep with mulch. And so it's just like, well, that's why all your plants are dead. So that's, so I just said, we just need to stop doing that and educate and keep people away from doing that and like wait, let the plants fill in, add some spring bulbs if you need to, to add that seasonal interest uh, to keep people's interest away from looking at the mulch. Um, but yeah, I think just like less mulching, using leaf mulch if we can. Yeah, so I, yeah, I use leaf compost or leaf mulch from my own garden and like have like a shredder if I need it as soon as possible, or just have like a heap or keep a area behind the garage or whatever. Um, and then, or if, 
Pine bark is a bark that breaks down quickly. So like a fine pine bark, um, you can get it in like quarter inch pieces. So you just don't want to put like two by fours on your plants and we'll be good. Yeah. I have an area that uh, I need to start working on that's shaded by some very large white pine. Oh. So what would you recommend as far as underneath white pine? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about like ground covers for evergreens because I don't, I've never had to work with that. And I know that's a tough one because it's so dry under there. It's just like, I would say like, I know some of my gardens at Midwest Ground Covers, we did, I think, Pacassandra in some areas and um, Sedum Ternatum is the native Sedum. Um, and that's tend to do like pretty good. I was trying to think what else, we use one more thing out there. But yeah, so Epimedia maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's that, yeah. So geranium, that's a great plant. So it's like, if you do get a little, cause I feel like it needs a little bit of moisture. Like, is it a heavy soil? If you have like heavier soil, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, so geranium, like the, like epimedium are workhorses too. The, but get rubrum or, um, or sulfurium, the yellow one. Cause the two, yeah. So the red or the yellow, um, barren wart, because they, they do, I love them. And I love putting them in groups, but they are a little bit slow. Um, so if you can be patient, but those are the faster of the, most of the epimedium. Yeah. You talk about the mix of the walnut trees. We have uh, shady areas that, that are, they're getting really overrun with garlic mustard. Mm. Um, well, if I try to eradicate that, is the ground gonna, like, will this stuff grow? Well, they say that that kind of poisons the soil. Yeah, I don't know um, if it's gonna. Yeah, I don't know if it's gonna poison. Yeah, if it, I, because I don't, I don't know what it emits back into the soil. Roy, what is the garlic mustard? Does that if if like someone gets it eradicated and like there's nothing that it emits into the soil that's gonna be a problem growing the ground cover layer, right? Yeah. As long as you on it with the it yeah. So if you just like in the spring, if you have your layer and they start coming back the next year, probably like making sure you're hacking them with the this until they fill in that second or third year when the perennials can be like the, we're in our third year and you can see things are touching and so it suppresses the weeds and they don't have to do as much work. But you can see, like I said, where there's space here, you might not use the Japanese forest grass, but use more carrots and use different tones of green and blue and uh, to get the different effect. And like I said, I think it's important to get that ground cover layer. And then like once that's established, you can start adding in your ferns and your meadow rue and uh, epimedium. But yeah, I think just, yeah, making sure they don't flower again and just like keeping them low so they don't overshade your perennials. So if you have to go through with a weed eater, just if it is a huge space to like weed eat those out so that you're getting sun to the plants below, that's all that really matters so that they can get established. Any other questions? Yeah. I planted Canadian ginger, and it's seeming to possibly uh, choke out things. But okay. Is that a bad idea to get that in? There? Yeah, I think it just depends. Like if it, like if there is a ground cover like that, the you just have to have tough plants coming through it. Like this Bowman's root is like so tough, and it comes up early. But if it's something that comes in in June, like it's probably gonna cover the basal foliage and suppress it like the garlic mustard would. So you want to just be able to make sure that it's stuff like Bowman's root or the polygonatums can come up through anything. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, just certain things that come up early and can handle that. So as long as they make it through they should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I noticed I use like, um, at Millennium Park, I use the autumn brilliance fern, which is the one that has those beautiful bronzing foliage, the dryopterus. Um, I use them in groups with the, uh, with the geranium Bevins variety. And then this greens up in like early April and the fronds from the fern are just coming up now. So in year three of the garden, the ferns are all gone because this out competed it because it comes in earlier. So if I were to put, you know, the Bowman's root, 
or the polygonatums coming up through this, it wouldn't be a problem. But since that plant just takes a minute to come in, um, it suppressed it out. And every year we'd have to go around and, you know, cut around it. And it's just, I, you know, I'd rather not spend the maintenance on that and just like move them somewhere else um, and change that. And so those are the things you learn as you garden. But as long as you learn from them and don't just keep doing the same thing, you're <laughs> on the right track. But yeah, thank you so much for coming. And I yeah, love seeing you all. And if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to ask me. I'll be around. So, happy planting. Get in there before I get my stash. <laughs> <laughs>